Hello, everyone. Welcome to the, our third session. Uh, we would like to introduce our keynote uh, speaker, Martin Pickering. Antonis, would you like to say a few words? Yes, of course. It's a great pleasure that we have Martin Pickering from Edinburgh, United Kingdom, with us today. Well, Martin is a specialist on language and society. And we must say that first, the human being is in the first place, a social being. We can't manage ourselves without uh, outside the social context. And furthermore, language is the most characteristic uh, phenomenon of the human being and its social function. We will enjoy Martin today. We will hear what he has to say about those interesting uh, topics and we will have the opportunity to discuss with him at the end of his talk. Uh, here you are, Martin, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to, to, to this wonderful conference. And um, I'm just very sorry not to be with you in person, of course, um, as I'm sure we all are, but uh, that's just the way things are. So, I mean, I'm a, I suppose, a psycholinguist, primarily a psychologist of language from Edinburgh, who I've been for a long time, and uh, I just work on a range of issues, primarily to do with language processing, to do with production and comprehension, to do with bilingualism, reading, and so on. But I'm but at least a lot of my theoretical work and some of my experimental work is focused on dialogue and how it might differ from what I would call monologue. And that's what I'm going to, to talk about today. So um, I will put my, my talk up um, here. Okay. Um, I hope that's all, all okay and that everyone can see that. Uh, it's always a bit strange giving these talks through, through Zoom or, or other methods like this because you, don't, you can't actually see who you're speaking to, though, though you, you may be able to see me. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. So my talk is called Understanding Dialogue, Language Use and Social Interaction. And I would immediately wish to acknowledge my co-worker, Simon Garrett, because this is based on our work over many, many years, and in particular, our recent book with the same title, which appeared earlier this year, published by Cambridge. Okay, so I'm going to start off not by talking about dialogue at all. I'm going to talk about joint action more generally. Okay, um, so you can see in this picture, you have two people, a man and a woman, who are making a piece of furniture together. And what they're doing is they're performing a joint action, a joint activity. So it's not an action that one of them's doing on, on their own, but they're both doing it together. It's both of them who are making the piece of furniture. And it's only because they're both doing things which are coordinated, we might say, with each other with the, that, that, they can, that they can make the furniture. That is, they're holding the pieces of furniture in the right place for the other one and, and so on. Okay, so what we have there is a type of cooperative joint activity, uh, which is a sort of notion that is related to a lot of, the, of, of work by philosophers trying to talk about what, what this might mean, joint activities more generally. In particular, we're influenced by, by Michael Blackman, the philosopher, but there are others who have, have made um, related arguments. So what in a, in a cooperative joint activity, as we, as we call it, It'd be things like making furniture together, singing a duet, or perhaps performing a move in um, basketball or some other sport. In such cases, the agents realize that they're both taking part and they're both committed to the activity. 
And then both agents have a joint intention. So A intends that A and B do X, and B intends also that A and B do X. In, in this case, build a piece of furniture. And also importantly, <coughs> they're mutually responsive. For example, they are committed to compensating for each other's mistakes. If one of them makes a mistake and the other one can correct it, then this is the other one's sort of duty, so to speak, as part of the, um, of the activity to do so. Okay. So in our case, the man and the woman are constructing a piece of backpack furniture. Each of them intends that both of them construct it. V holds the components in place so that he can screw them together in this picture. The joint action works only because their individual actions are compatible in time and space. So it doesn't matter exactly how high off the ground the woman holds the two pieces of wood. Um, and it doesn't matter exactly how high off the ground the, the man is holding the screwdriver. What is critical is that they fit with each other, that that is they're the same height as each other. And similarly, it doesn't matter the exact time in which they perform the activity, but both of them are performing the appropriate part of the activity at the right time. So these two people are part of a dyadic system that involves two people and the furniture. And that's how I, we sort of analyze things. We can analyze or theorize about the system as a whole. And we can also theorize about the individuals within the system. That is the sorts of things that are going on within their bodies or their minds that allow them to perform this activity. By the way, I'm talking about, I mean, although I'm talking about activities could involve more than two people, but in all the examples, I, I'm interested in two people, essentially which I regard as the sort of basic site of these kinds of things. Okay, um, so uh, this is, we, we interpret this, our, our framework uh, to explain this is, is what we call a shared workspace framework. And what happens is that the individuals, the two people here, post their behaviors to a shared workspace. And this is workspace contains the results of their actions. That is, it is a combination of their actions themselves, their actual movements of their, their hands and so on, and the props, that is, the pieces of furniture or the screwdriver or what have you. But this workspace is a publicly shared resource. It's not an internal representation, but rather it is, it can, it is shared objects of internal representations. It's the shared size of reality that both can observe and manifest. It's sort of typically and manipulate, so it's typically manifest both of them. So that means that they, they can both act on it and know that the others can act on it and, and, and so on. And it, we think of this as kind of Gibsonian in a sense, the way we think about this. That is that the, 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 the objects, the, the things out there in the world, that, that uh, in the workspace are things in the world that both people can act on and manipulate together. They have sort of what we call joint affordance. Um, there's a contrast, important contrast between the private stages of acting, which take place within the individuals, and the public stages, which take place in the shared workspace, or if you like, put into the shared workspace. So the, the shared workspace framework can be, um, I'm going to come up with two different kinds of diagrams, as you'll see. Um, this, this diagram here is, is a sort of basic one that, that, that gives you an, an understanding of the shared workspace framework. And here we have two individuals, A and B, and we have inside each of those individuals, you have um, their, their sort of their, the things that are in them, that is their joint action planner and their joint action implementer. And then above them, we have the um, shared workspace. So firstly, the joint action planner is concerned with planning the action, including determining each individual's roles within that action. And then above that, you have the joint action implementer, which serves to execute the plan. OK, you could call this an executor or, or an executive rather than an implementer, but executive is a rather ambiguous term in psychology that's used in different, different levels, as it were. Um, it, so we, we call it the joint action implementer. And then coming out of the implementer is the action itself. So the, the thick black arrow that comes out of the implementer 
is, is, is what posts the action to the workspace. It's thick because it's actually doing something. It's posting the action, as you say, the man's arm movements to the workspace. And then as well as that, you have these thin pink arrows, okay? And the thin pink arrows, well, let's just decompose this. When the, the vertical, um, the vertical pink arrow, when it's pointing downwards, is what is involved in perception of what's in the workspace. So the man, let's say, if that's A, is perceiving, um, is, is perceiving what the man and the woman are doing, and the props as well, and that's going in the downwards direction. And in the upwards direction, the, the, the man is predicting what, let's say, the man or the woman or both of them together are, are doing. Okay, so the, so the, the, the upward direction corresponds to prediction. And then the horizontal arrows are concerned with, with um, predicting and interpreting one's own, one's own internal states. That is, for example, the state of your muscles as you're moving your arm. Okay, and then it's the same for B, obviously. And then at the top, we have the workspace, which contains the actor's contribution as well as the prop. Okay, now, why was I talking about all of that? Well, because obviously I think of dialogue as a form of cooperative joint activity. And we interpret it using the shared workspace framework. So let's just take a little piece of dialogue from the classic paper of Simons, um, Garrett and Anderson, where you have two people, A and B, trying to negotiate their way around a complicated maze. And in particular, at this point, in the transcript, they are trying to determine A's location, or rather B is trying to determine A's location, which is indicated by this arrow. And as you can see, the language here is really confusing, repetitive, fragmentary. It doesn't look anything like formal texts or formal written prose, for example. And that's very interesting in itself. Um, and you need to be able to have a theory that can explain all of this. And what I'm going to do is focus on a little bit at the bottom here, where from lines nine to 12, actually, where A, from the point where B says, you're one along. Okay, so here we have B saying, you're one along. A goes, aha, uh -huh. B says, and one up, and A says, yeah. So A and B are seeking to determine that they agree on A's maze location. To do this, they play what we call an information probing dialogue game. That is with B as the prober in 9 and 11, and A as the respondent in 10 and 12. So this sort of dialogue game is kind of, in some sense, the dialogical equivalent of a speech, but it's framed in, in, in dialogical terms relating to both, both people. So they both represent the game as manifest in their dialogue the game model. They're both they're aware and they're both aware of it. Um, and the description one along dot 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 and one up depends on a particular situation model, which assumes a path scheme. That is, you're sort of as though you're tracing your way through the maze with, a, with the origin at the bottom left hand box. So you're going sort of horizontally and then you're going vertically. You could, you could have a completely different um, situation model based on a coordinate scheme where this might be called B2, for example. But in this case, you're, it's, 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 um, it's a path scheme that's being used. OK, so we can think of this then in terms of the, the shared workspace framework. And here I've put the figure up again as I had before, except I've now changed the, 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 um, the, the terms. OK, so uh, now we have within A and B, we have a dialogue planner and a dialogue implement. So the dialogue planner contains the situation model and the dialogue game model for A or for B. And then above that, we have the dialogue implementer, which essentially corresponds to the mechanisms that are used for production and comprehension, but specifically as applied to dialogue rather than in terms of monologue. So this is, this is much more like what most, well, not most, but a large proportion of psycholinguistics tends to be concerned with, this the process of, di of the dialogue implementer. And then um, at the top, you have the shared workspace, again, which contains B's contribution, your one along and one up in um, normal fonts, and then A's contribution in italics, aha. Uh -huh. 
as well, of course, as the, the context, the, the maze itself or the plot. Though you might think of the, the what's relevant is, some, is more A's location rather than the whole of the maze. Okay, and now we have um, the process of producing the contributions. And here again, we have, of course, this coming out of the thick black arrow. So when A says, aha, or when B says, you're one along, that's that they're using the thick black arrow to do that. And um, similarly, you have the, the thin pink arrows. So again, when they're pointing, the vertical one pointing downwards corresponds essentially to comprehension. When it's pointing upwards, it's, it corresponds to prediction, predicting what the other person is likely to say next. And then the horizontal arrows, which I won't be concerned with after this, are concerned essentially with internal monitoring for sort of working out what, what as you're preparing what you're going to say, for example, what, um, you know, and maybe correcting yourself if you're saying the wrong thing, that kind of thing. This corresponds in some sense to inner, inner loop monitoring in a framework like labels in, 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 in monological terms. Okay, so the shared workspace framework for dialogue then, each interlocutor works out what to say internally and posts that to the workspace. The workspace is a publicly shared resource. As I've said, it contains signs, that is words and gestures, etc. Not interpreted signs, but just the signs themselves. Um, what, that is what A has said, what B has said, plus relevant context as well. And it's the it's size of reality that both of them can observe and manipulate, in this case, by continuing the dialogue. And as I say, it's typically manifested by the knowledge. The dialogue planner sits underneath the implementer and provides the basis for implementation. So A will plan a move in a dialogue game, such as you know, interrogating or whatever, and implements that move by posting utterances. So far, we've assumed that planning is decided at the beginning and simply organizes implementation, as in our furniture building example. And our furniture building example is, is like that. But interlocutors, of course, dynamically develop their dialogue plan. So informal conversation rarely has a fixed goal that's decided at the outset in the same way that building a piece of furniture has this fixed goal at the outset. OK, now, uh, Interlocutors are concerned with joint prediction, interpretation, and control of the dialogue. So interlocutors construct joint dialogue percepts, for example, a contribution and a commentary on that, like one along and aha. Uh -huh. you, you would that's the that's the unit that will then get interpreted, and that the meaning will be will, will be A agreeing with B or A and B being aligned with each other, as I'll come on to. Um, and or you might have question answer pairs, for example. And what happens is the interlocutors jointly post them to the shared workspace. Obviously, they post their own part of it, but it becomes joint when it's in the shared workspace. And they monitor these percepts and use the output to inform their next contribution, whether it might be a, a correction for themselves or the other, or take it to the floor or whatever, and also to update their prediction of their partner's contribution. This output goes via the dialogue planner, that is the situation model and the dialogue game model. So now what I'm going to do is turn that figure sort of on its side and think of things in a rather more, slightly more control-based sort of quasi-computational way. Um, so I put this figure on its side for the shared workspace on the, the right-hand side and A and B on, on the left. And I'm just thinking of this example of your one along, aha, uh -huh, just to explain how this would work. Okay, so what happens is that the, uh, when B says, plans to say you're one along, B produces what we call a production command, essentially the intention to speak to say you're one along. And at this point, A also predicts that B will speak because B is speaking at that point, it's B's turn to speak or whatever. So A predicts that B is going to produce a description of some kind at that point. Now, when B says you're one along, this, this does two things. I mean, one is that B actually says your one along, and the other is that B predicts that B will say your one along. So the actual saying is by the black arrow, and the prediction is via B, the, the, the red arrow coming out of B's production command. And A only predicts because A isn't actually speaking at this point, so A uses the, 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 the red arrow as well. 
Okay, now then, what happens at that point is that B actually says your one along, and this enters the shared workspace. At this point, A and B, both of them, perceive what's in the shared workspace, and they they then they they compare their perception of what of of of, of this what's in the workspace with their prediction of what they would perceive. Okay, and they do this in the dotted box, which is the, which is the B, the monitoring box. Okay, so B, so we can think of it like this. Firstly, think of B, which is easy. B predicts that B is going to say your one along, unless there's a speech error, this is what happens. And B actually does say your one along. So B's prediction matches B's actual utterance. So there's no what we call prediction error coming out of that. So no, the nothing flows back along the dotted line from the dotted box to B's dialogue planner. Okay, but in the case of A, there's, a, there's, there's something of a mismatch because they said it's a description of some kind that actually got a concrete description, your one along, and therefore there is a mismatch. And A, and th th this means that some information flows back from the monitoring process to A's dialogue plan. But this, but this is not a difficult thing for A to, to, uh, to incorporate. It's a change to what was predicted, but it's, it's straightforward for A to incorporate. A can incorporate this mis mismatch straightforwardly. B, on the other hand, uh, there's no change to the plan at all. So then, because A incorporates the mismatch straightforwardly, A then some, from the A's dialogue plan, A therefore plans to produce a production command to produce a positive commentary. That is an aha in this case, something that says, yes, I believe that you and I are aligned. And therefore, and, and, and that, that works, B predicts that A will produce a positive commentary. And then A says, aha. And as you can see, the whole process sort of cycles around round and round you've got a, a sort of a, a structure that, that loops round so you can keep going on and on and also that it can be split between a and b okay so what we have is a kind of distributed control the interlocutors distribute control over the progress of the dialogue and it rarely is the case that one interlocutor is in sole command rather both of them can, can decide who should act and, and, and when they, they both can, can make their own decisions the decisions about the dialogue are shared, who should speak and when, what they should talk about, what they should do if the dialogue appears to be going off course, and they can exert control as necessary. It can work because the interlocutors are typically well aligned. Now, what I mean by aligned, a term I've already used a couple of times, is that they activate and use the same linguistic representations. They realize when they're engaged in the same dialogue game, they have similar representations of the situation under discussion. They're also synchronized, I mean, similar rates of speech as well, but I'll ignore that um, for today's purposes. So when you go back to this other figure here, you can see that you've got your dialogue implementer and your dialogue planner for both A and B. And, and what, what it means for them to be aligned is to have similar representations in the implement and in the planner to each other. Okay. So alignment occurs when interlocutors have similar representations to each other at many levels. What, what happens is that interlocutors tend to repeat each other's linguistic choices at many levels, their words, their, their syntax, their so on. And this leads to them aligning their underlying representations. They can also align their dialogue models, their, dialogue, their, their models of the games and the situation they discuss. It might be, for example, both using a path scheme. For Alignment underlies communicative success. Um, when you have a, a fully aligned situation model, then you have the same understanding of the situation under discussion. Okay, so the, this alignment works be, be what we call channels of alignment, which I put these dotted lines between A and B, uh, which I'll just blow up here um, for the implementer here. You can see that the, what, what we're claiming is there's alignments of the syntax, the semantics, the phonology, and also the way they're bound together, which corresponds to using routines sort of fixed expressions. Um, now, there's not a causal link between these two people. That would involve wireless connections or telepathy or something, which of course doesn't happen. So they the, rather the connections work via, via posting things to the shared, um, the shared workspace. And similarly, you can have alignment of the dialogue planners. That is, the game models become aligned when you're playing the same game. That the um, the uh, situation models are aligned when you have similar understanding. Okay, 
So you can actually think of alignment, I'll just say this briefly, so in having two dimensions. You've got this linguistic alignment and the dial dialogue and model alignment on one dimension, but you've also got what we can call focal and global alignment as well. Focal alignment means essentially that your your, the current focus, what's in attention at that moment, is the same. So linguistically, this, this occurs when you use the same words as each other. But, so, sorry, when, when, you're, when, when you use a word and I understand the word that you're using, that's, that's, that's sort of linguistic focal alignment because we've got the same activation of the same concepts and the same words at that point. And the situation model Focal alignment is like having a line short term working memory, whereas global alignment is having the same representation as a whole, or at least supposed to be related representation as a whole. So, linguistic global alignment is when the same words, etc., are accessible. And this leads to the tendency to repeat aspects of sentences behind the time and things like that. And situation model global alignment is, a, is something like a line long term working memory when you can access general knowledge of relevant aspects of general knowledge bind them into your, um, your working memory model. And um, global alignment is, is the residue of focal alignment. Okay, now the workspace is a limited resource. Dialogue succeeds through alignment, but also through saying just enough. It's a, this notion of, that comes out of, of Herb Clark originally of least collaborative efforts, that you, you, you try to have conversations in a way that reduce the amount of effort for for, the, for you as a pair, both you and your partner. Now, for us, this is a consequence of a limited workspace. The workspace is limited in what can go in it, so you don't put more in it than is necessary. So, therefore, interlocutors do things like try to reduce their referring expression. So they might start off with a long description of an object, and then they end up, over time, using a much shorter description of the same object when they realise that that works. That sort of reduction is a consequence of a positive commentary. So like a yeah or an okay or even a nod, if you don't have that, you don't get any reduction. So over time, if you keep talking about the same things and you, and you say okay, then the, 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 the referring expressions you use become shorter. Linguistic alignment itself doesn't seem to be affected by these commentaries like yes and nods, but commentary checks alignment and leads to reduction. Now, what I mean by checks is a bit sort of unclear. What I mean by this is sort of what we think of as the meta-representation of alignment. So meta-representation of alignment is um, that you indicate, you believe that you and your partner share a representation. So when you say something to me and I go, yeah, what, that, what I see that what other people might interpret as saying, well, that's, that's an indication that you understand. The, what I see it as is saying, it's an indication that I believe that you and I have, have the same mental state as each other. So, so when, you know, when the first person has called the director says something long and then the, 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 the match gives a positive commentary, then the director will shorten their expression after. Now, you also get a mess of representation of misalignment in the same way. So in this example from Hawthorne and Gehrig, um, B produces a long description and A gets an mm. In this, mm, in this case, is a negative commentary. It means I, some, I'm not following you in some way. Um, and specifically, what it seems to mean is that A doesn't understand who the she refers to, and B therefore expands this, produces, changes she into Isabel, and A says that's not okay. So it seems to be that B has responded in the right way. So A can't build a situation model that matches. A's belief about these models. Okay, so you can see this in terms of this figure as well, a misalignment case. So B, um, at the starting point, B is trying to say she, and A is predicting that B is going to produce a reference to a specific person. So, so B is going to say she and does say she. Okay, now at this point, a predicts a reference to a specific person whom A is going to be able to identify. But actually what happens is you get a mismatch because A can't interpret this word, she can't determine who the reference of she is. Therefore, there's a mismatch between A's prediction, which was that A would be able to work out which specific person was being referred to and what actually happens, that A can't work it out. B has no problem, of course. Um, 
but but when we just look at A, then you get this, you get a a mismatch in the, in the monitoring process that leads to this feedback to A's dialogue planner. And in this case, this, this the amount of feedback is is considerable and leads to A's not being able to deal with this. In other words, A can't incorporate the mismatch into their dialogue planner. That they, on the other hand, there's no change to the plan in B. Therefore, A sends a command, say, mm, that is to produce a negative commentary, which is what you do if you don't, if you can't incorporate the mismatch. B, on the other hand, incorrectly predicts that a positive commentary, that is B predicts that A is going to understand. Okay, so A then says, hmm. And at this point, if you keep going on from this, then because B has predicted, incorrectly predicted a positive commentary, then and and hasn't got a positive commentary, then B encounters this mismatch. Okay, so B's prediction mismatches A's utterance, and then B has to repair. And as you can really see, you can go on like this, and hopefully the, the, the error is corrected as it is in this case. Okay, so that's basically the outline of the model. Um, and, and really that's the end of the, most of the talk. Um, what I just want to say quickly is that in, in monologue, um, the, the account is, is, is designed to deal with dialogue, but can also deal with monologue, as well as dealing with multi-party dialogue and things like this. So in monologue, a writer or radio broadcaster produces a text, okay? Not, not a concept you have in dialogue. The comprehender can't respond because there's no black arrow, and therefore uh, the, the writer or broadcaster, whoever it is, typically the, the, the producer, that is, hones the text very carefully, so, tries to organ, write it or, or speak it in a way that's easy to understand. And all this, this honing process goes place internally because, because the addressee can't produce helpful feedback. So the comprehender also internalizes example drawing influences and this is a difficult skilled process for both of them so you can see this essentially in this kind of example here where all i've done is taken out the the the, the black arrow from b and also the horizontal arrow because obviously that, that, that this only occurs if there's a black arrow so b doesn't have this so so a can speak uh, let's say and then b can can comprehend what A is saying. B could indeed predict what A is going to say next, but B can't actually contribute. Okay, so summary then conclusions. The interlocutors post joint contributions to the shared workspace and they monitor those contributions in relation to their joint predictions. They align linguistic representations and dialogue game representations. And in this way, dialogue supports alignment of situation models and hence communicative. That's it. Okay, thank you, Martin. Thank you. Uh, you can stop sharing now. Yep. And for any questions, please raise the hand at the reactions tab. Yes, Gloria. It was just uh, okay. Yes, Antonis. Thank you very much, Martin. I really enjoyed this, the, the approach of yours about the cooperation, about mm -hmm. anything we do here in life. And I just suspect I haven't thought about those things. It's right away. Uh, we have constructed the language in a cooperation way as we do with other things in life. And uh, I mean to say, language is par excellence a dialogue. I mean to say to my to my I think that there is no other way of setting up a, a linguistic system outside the frame of a dialogue. I mean to say 
even monologues or long monologues or even a book, you have an audience, uh, you have your readers, and it's a type of dialogue, you communicate, and then you have the social context. We can't get rid of it. I mean, to say you deliver a lecture today and you have chosen your presentation. Let's say you were invited in a, in a high school in, in, in your neighbor. You should use another language and have another presentation. And hearing you, I wrote down here a definition. I would like to have your response. Language is the verbal cooperation of individuals in a social context. Previously, I would say language is the verbal communication, but I like your term, cooperation. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of interesting points you're making there. I think to start at the end, cooperation um, rather than communication is the way we like to think about it because we don't, because communication, I mean, I mean, of course we are thinking of communication, but there is a style of thinking about communication, which is very much a transfer notion where you just have one person who's, who says something to the other person and then the other person understands it and that's all that takes place, the sort of code model of, of, of language. And we rather think of, di of, of dialogue as essentially where both people are cooperating to an activity together and it's the, the success is, is, depends on both of them putting things into the, into the dialogue and then when the result is, is what you want it to be, that is if I ask you a question and you answer it and we discuss it a bit more, at the end of it we both get to an understanding which is not what either one of us had at the beginning but is something, something new. So, so very much I think of it um, like that. The, um, I mean, there's, there is also a question about exactly dialogue. The term dialogue is used slightly differently by different people. You know, there's a sort of, um, so the way I, I want to use dialogue to mean language where both people are contributing. I mean, if you, you can certainly say that when you read a book or um, then there is a dialogue taking place between you and the author, but it's a sort of, it's, it's sort of an implicit sense. I mean, I can't, I can't interrogate the author if I don't understand what they mean, and they and they of course can't speak to me either. So there is a there is a different sense going on there. But of course, all of monologue, if you like, has its has its basis in in dialogue, as as you know, many people have argued, and 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 I, I certainly would not disagree with that. As I say, I think some of this comes down to sort of a bit of definitional stuff, not not you know exactly what you mean by the terms like dialogue and monologue. We might think that monologue is the derivation uh, of verbal expressions from dialogue. I mean, dialogue is yes. the, the linguistic reality. I think that's reasonable. Yes, I, 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 would, I, I would take that view, yes. Um, Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you.